Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello dear learners, I am Dr. Himani Singh working as an assistant professor in Institute of Business Management, GLA University, Mathura. I welcome you all to the session 12 of the course that is professional communication for managers and session 12 is on employment communication, again a very important topic for all the budding managers. In this session, I am going to talk about two very important aspects when it comes to the employment for all the budding managers. That is the group discussion as well as the preparation of resume. In the group discussion, I am going to tell you the basic process, do's, don'ts, types of the group discussion and also moving forward, I will be taking care of resume preparation that how to build an effective resume and also I will be talking about designing as well as the drafting aspect of a resume and also I am going to share some of the bad examples which you might come across of the resumes which tends to in fact deteriorate your reputation with the employer. So now let us begin with what we mean by group discussion. The word discuss, it has been taken from a Latin word that is discutir, to mean to shake or to strike. Now what are we doing when we are discussing something? We are trying to shake the ideas of that person, we are trying to shake the ideas among all that group and we are trying to bring some meaningful interpretation, meaningful discussion out of that. So when we talk about group discussion, it is actually a process of reflective thinking. Now why I am saying reflective thinking? Because when we participate in the discussion, we tend to reflect on our own ideas, thoughts as well as the ideas and thoughts of the other group members and that is how we tend to assimilate the whole concept, the whole content and we tend to present our ideas in front of the other people. So that is why we do call it as reflective thinking, wherein we, what we are doing, we are giving a reflection about our thoughts about other person's thoughts and we are trying to assimilate as sorry assimilate it as a whole picture. So now when we talk about group discussion, a very common question might be coming in your mind that why group discussion? For you why it is important to understand that what is a group discussion, what are the intricacies of group discussion, what are the do's, don'ts and so on. So the very first point which I want to highlight in front of you which is going to even convince you more that why you should go on for understanding this concept is because group discussions test the soft skills of the candidates. Now soft skills include a big bunch of skills. During the group discussion the panelist or the moderator out there, what they are looking after? They are looking after different type of soft skills that whether this candidate possess these skills or does not possess, whether to keep this candidate for the employment in my organization or not. So one aspect is that for group discussion, why we conduct group discussion because the companies they want to test or evaluate 
and individuals are candidates soft skills and not just this in fact you will be finding that is it is one of the most quick method to shortlist few candidates out of a big bunch think about the situation that you are having 100 candidates who have applied for a particular position now if you are going to go for interviewing all those 100 candidates for just one job position how much time you will take lot of time even if you spend only 15 minutes per person then also you are going to take huge time but rather than going directly to the interview right what you can do is you can shortlist around 40 candidates how you can shortlist you just go for a group discussion and out of that group discussion what you can do you can make 10 groups in a group only 10 people are there ask them to discuss something and just select few of them out of that group you need not to call each and every person to the interview room so that's a quick method which you can use and also when we talk about group discussions it is basically for testing the personality skills communication skills and individuals teamwork confidence somewhere when we talk about problem solving also social skills behavior and so on so all these skills as a moderator as a panelist you are able to check in the group discussion only now when i talk about group discussion it has certain features the very first feature of group discussion is that it provides an interface what is a group discussion it is an interaction interaction between the group people between the group members or among the group members wherein all of them they are coming up with their thought process they are putting up their points they just want to prove themselves that yes this is what i am i am a leader i possess good communication so how it is happening by the interaction lot of interaction lot of interface is present there apart from this when we talk about group discussion you will be finding that there is a leader in a group discussion there are other members there are certain leaders not just one it can be more than one also but majorly you will be finding that the person who is having the most good leadership skills he stood as a leader there a leader is going to bring the things back on the track a leader is going to be a person who will be leading that group towards a particular direction and other members they will be there they'll be just putting up their points they'll be coming up with their ideas their issues their feelings and that's how group discussion is moving forward also when we talk about group discussion participation is very much required if the group members are not participating then what's the point in going for a group discussion better you should have decided the things individually if there is no participation then it is not serving the basic purpose of group discussion that is of generating ideas from different sources if there is no participation how you can think of generating ideas of course it is just going to be your idea only so that is what is about the basic you can say feature or characteristic of group discussion that an effective group discussion needs to have good participation among the members if that participation is missing then there is no point conducting a group discussion apart from this when we talk about features another thing is interpersonal attraction yes during the discussion you will be finding that you are liking the points of some people you are disliking the points of some other people some other group members and the points with whom you are getting a liking kind of thing you will be able to empathize with them you will be able to support them by placing your points with them and that is what is more about the interpersonal communication 
yes you are the part of the group but still in that interpersonal in that group you are able to exhibit your interpersonal group either through your verbal component or through your non-verbal component if i'm agreeing or liking the other person's point i might simply nod my head like this so this is what is happening the interpersonal communication is taking place there also so that is more about interpersonal attraction last but not the least one yes group discussions many a times it tends to have a pressure to go on for confirmation you will be coming across this situation also see i am not saying that you need to confirm no not at all if you don't find if you don't believe that uh, that particular point needs to be confirmed with don't go for it i am not saying this what i'm saying is that it is one feature that wherein you will be finding that during the group discussion some people they seek confirmation and you need to confirm them so that is another aspect of a group discussion so moving forward i am going to highlight the basic group discussion process how it takes place when i say group discussion process first i'll be highlighting the participants number ideally we go for 6 to 10 participants in a group discussion yes it may reach up to the maximum limit 15 but again that is a threshold limit now you might be saying that oh in certain group discussions i saw 20 people were discussing 25 people were discussing and see you are telling me that maximum or the threshold limit is 15 uh yes people do go for that but what i am talking about is ideal participation i am attaching the word ideal participation and if you are talking about ideal participation you should have either 6 to 10 or 10 to 15 or 10 to 12 people in a group then only you will be able to focus each and every person's point otherwise you might miss what different people are quoting and it might seems as a fish market kind of thing because so many people they are coming up with their thoughts with their ideas but none of them is able to communicate or put across properly so that is about the participants the number of the participants in a group discussion apart from that when we talk about duration that what's the duration of an ideal group discussion for example if i talk about um, some interview process some selection process rather so in a selection process we are using group discussion as a selection criteria right now majorly we should plan if it is a it is like we have 10 to 12 people in a group discussion then we should ideally give 12 to 15 minutes for that discussion it can be up to 20 minutes also but not beyond that is not the ideal one fine see what i'm talking about is ideal one so what needs to be the duration but again if you are going for a group discussion wherein you need to thoroughly look for some new change plan which needs to be inculcated or brought into the a company or the organization then in that case the duration might be longer so that depends that what is your objective for the group discussion right apart from that you will be finding that you are having moderators or panelists in the group discussion now we use the term panelist when uh, through a group discussion we are judging anyone's performance or we are evaluating an individual so we tend to use panelist term more oftenly but when it is a group discussion wherein we try or we want to generate different ideas from different people in that case most of the time you will be finding that we are using a term that's moderator because he is not going to participate in the discussion 
but he or she is going to moderate the discussion so that it should be flowing in the right direction with the right momentum as well as with the right theme. So, that is about different aspects when we talk about a GD process. Now, how did it start, how it goes? See, when we talk about a GD process, before the topic announcement, you will be going for your seating. Now, when I talk about seating, in a group discussion room, you will be finding a horseshoe shaped kind of seating arrangement normally when it is about the selection process wherein all the participants they will be sitting like this and the panelists or the moderators they are going to be placed here panelist now panelists they can be more than one it can be four to five again it depends that uh, how many moderators or how many panelists you want. So, this is normally a case that how seating is being done. Now, when you are going for the selection process for an inter for a job right, you will be asked to go and sit accordingly. Be very very clear with your seating, very clear because most of the time what happens is that the panelist he or she can recognize you only by your seating place number. For example, we are starting one from here, two is here, three, four and so on and Mr. X was supposed to sit on seat number one, but when he entered the room, he started sitting from here. So, the whole row is going to be placed in the wrong manner. So, be very careful about the seating arrangement. Sit there. Now, what happens in most of the time uh, at most of the places, either you are going to be aware that for what reason you are going to be discussion, right? But when it is about an interview or the selection criteria, during the group discussion, right? When you enter the group discussion room, at that time you will be allotted a topic. Either there is going to be a bowl kept in front of you in which different chits are there and you might be asked to pick one chit out of that and you need to just make it as a group discussion topic or else it can be that the panelists or the moderators they are providing you with just one topic. No option is being given to you. So, that depends again on the choice of the panelist or the employer right they are going to announce the topic so once the topic is announced to you then after that you will be given some time and in that time you can think over that topic so that is what preparation time normally this preparation time is just one minute one to two minutes at the maximum not beyond that so, for that always remember that you should carry a notepad or a pen with you so that you can write down your thoughts about the topic. You can place your thoughts during the discussion so that you should not fail to just uh, memorize or you just don't forget those points. So, keep on writing it. Once the topic is announced, you will be getting some time to think over it, then, then starts the discussion. Now, who is going to start? Who is going to initiate? Remember one thing, when we talk about initiation, the lead starts the discussion followed by other participants. Now, when I say lead, for sure there is going to be some person in the group who wants to take lead that, okay, I will be starting with this topic, right? So, that is going to take place and then during the discussion, you people are going to discuss and then towards the end, you are going to summarize the group discussion. And when I say summarize, it is not your summary, your point of view. When we say GD summarization, it means that you need to summarize the whole group discussion 
whether people quoted some positive facts or some negative, you need to summarize the group discussion, not only your point of view. This is very, very important. Most of the time what happens, people tend up just coming up with their own conclusion. Ki okay, uh, I just believe this. In the end, I just want to quote my own belief. No, it is GD summarization. You need to summarize the GD, not your point of view. And then towards the end, you will be getting judge, judged by the moderators or the panelists. So, this is how a GD process moves on. Fine. I hope this is clear in your mind. Now, uh, again, just a quick revision that why GD is important. GDs are important because it helps you in instilling the confidence because the moment you feel like that you are able to communicate your points in a group, you feel confident, you feel more confident and not just this, it also helps you in focusing on the deep thinking about your points as well as the other person's point. With this, it is also about enhancing, it helps in enhancing the communication skills, whether it is about content or non-verbal skills, I am going to focus on both of them. Yes, at the same time, when I say increases confidence, it removes the hesitation of speaking. So, this is one good thing, you should more oftenly participate in the group discussion. The more oftenly you are going to participate, it is going to help you in controlling your fears, in overcoming your less confidence or nervousness, this is going to really help you out. Yes, it is also good because it tells us that how to work in a team, how a team can work when the team members, they are having different point of views towards one particular issue. So, this is also one benefit out of it. It tells you that what behavior you should go on at the formal front. Also, it helps in making you or developing good listening skills because if in a group discussion you are not listening to the other person's point of view, how you think that you will be talking about teamwork, how you think that you will be talking about putting up your points, you need to develop listening skills or it helps in developing listening skills, not just this diversity of ideas is being reached as well as the Recruitment as last criteria, recruitment or selection you can say can be the one thing that we are doing with the help of group discussions, fine. So, now I am just going to focus upon that what are the different types of group discussions. Yes, you will be coming across two broad categories that is topic based group discussion or case based group discussion. First, when I say topic based group discussion, you will be getting a topic and on that topic, you need to put your points across that what you feel like about that point. Now, when I say topic based, it is again categorized into few more subcategories. The topic based GD is controversial topics. For example, when we talk about some issues like reservation religion, they are more of the controversial topic. Now, why a company, why an employer is going to give some controversial topic? Because they want to check stress handling skills of the candidate. They want to check that how much emotionally stable that person is. So, these are some of the ways by which you can check some specific skills of the participants. Also, when we talk about topic based, the other category is knowledge based topics. Now, when I say knowledge based topics, they are certain times very closely linked with the economic topics also, wherein I am providing this topic to the people to the candidates because I want to check their basic level of knowledge or their aspects that how they interpret the economic issues around them and so on. So, that is what I am trying to check their knowledge, their experience and what they know, what they think, what is their thinking pattern about some issue, their thinking pattern, right. 
Now next in line, when I talk about topic based GDs, topic based group discussions, the other category is abstract topics. Abstract topics are that you just want to give such topics because you want to check creativity, out of the box thinking. innovativeness that is what you are looking for for example giving a topic like onion giving a topic like red these are abstract topics right wherein these topics they are being given during the selection criteria because I want to somewhere look for your creativity that how you interpret things how you interpret some uh, situation in your own manner fine next in line is conceptual topics now conceptual topics you will be finding more of the social topics wherein I just want to go on for looking after the concept for example I just want to go for cryptocurrency and I, I want to check that what people know about the concept of cryptocurrency right so these are some of the topic based group discussions apart from that you might be getting some case study based group discussions. When I say case study based, so what will be happening? The panelists, they are going to give you some kind of small caselets, some kind of hypothetical situation and then you are asked to discuss or to sort that problem or how that problem can be sorted, how or what decisions you will be taking. So like this, it is moving on. So that situation, a hypothetical situation will be given to all the group members and those group members now need to discuss that how things are going to work upon. So this is what is case based, wherein I just want to look for the analytical skills of the people, of my, of the members who are the part of that particular group, the decision making skills, the problem solving skills, the crisis management skills of the people or the candidates into that particular group. So these are some of the types of group discussion. Now taking forward this session, I just want to focus more upon the do's as well as the don'ts of group discussion. Now as a candidate, as a member of the group, what do you think are going to be the do's as well as the don'ts, the tips, the strategies for making yourself doing well during the group discussion. Yes, when we talk about group discussions and from last few minutes I am talking about group discussion, that is more of a formal way, formal interaction, right. So when I am saying formal interaction, we need to dress formally for group discussion. Why I am saying this? Because when you dress formally, when you appear formal, that again gives a positive indication that enhances your confidence also. So always remember when you are going for a group discussion, you should not be casually dressed. You should always be professionally dressed, dress for success we call it as and when we say dress for success again that is a good idea that you should go on for some more uh, dark shades in comparison to the light one or the flowery one that is again more of the professional aspect. Apart from this, one very important aspect in the group discussion and which people tend to miss upon is eye contact. They put very strong points, very very strong points, but they are not going to have proper eye contact with the people around them or else they are only going to have or they are only going to make eye contact with one or the other person, one or two people in that group with whom they think that their uh, vibrations are matching, their frequency is matching. They are not going to look into the eyes of the other people around them, which is very, very incorrect. Always remember that all the members should have proper eye contact. But with this, I also want to highlight that when I talk about having eye contact, when you are going for the selection GDs, never make eye contact with the panelist. Why? Any idea? 
you should never make the eye contact with the panelist because panelists are not the part of discussion for you they are just sitting there to evaluate you they are not the part of discussion so don't make eye contact with the panelist you should make eye contact with all the members sitting in the group discussion i hope i am coming with this point to you right now when it is about group discussion and people see oh my selection is at stake i should speak i should not allow any other person to speak no that's a wrong strategy that shows your interpersonal communication skills what kind of a person you are you do you are not allowing others to speak that's not a good strategy not a good strategy yes i'm not saying that you should not put your point put your points put your points with full assertiveness but at the same time leave some space leave some room for the other people also to speak otherwise that is not a discussion and that's not the capability or the quality of a leader no i think you are misinterpreting a leader always allows others to speak as well so always leaves room uh, so that others can also speak and at the same time never be aggressive people take discussions as arguments or debate it's not a debate you should not debate you should discuss if you are debating if you are arguing then it's wrong idea and the moment you will be getting into the argument you will become aggressive see you should be assertive when you are making your points when you are putting your points across be assertive put your points strongly but that does not mean that you should get into the aggressiveness you end up having a heated argument with the other group member never never do this not just this in fact throughout your group discussion maintain positive attitude positive attitude what do you mean by this that okay this is my point of view i respect the other person's point of view also whether he is going in my direction or in the opposite direction that is what is positive attitude is ki okay fine whatever points i am putting they are correct as per my knowledge as per my belief but at the same time i also respect your points not just this speak sensibly many a times what happens not only uh, through words through gestures also right when you raise a finger towards some of the group member that's not a right way of gesture during the or speaking during the discussion you tend to use some abusive words during the discussion no speak sensibly what you are speaking don't speak just for the sake of putting up your points think wisely before speaking articulate your words remember you got initial few minutes one or two minute to articulate your words your thoughts at that time you should articulate properly and then put your points across no problem there is no point in coming up with xyz thing which is not at all relevant to the discussion with speaking always remember listen carefully also listen to each and every person's point it is going to help you out how it is going to help you out when you will be concluding is going to help you out in concluding the gd not just this in fact you can come up with the counter points if you are not listening how you are going to come up with counter points how you are going to explain your position so listen carefully and also try to bring discussion on the track if people are moving somewhere else deviating somewhere else bring them back yes in that manner you act as a leader also and that shows your leadership skill okay one more point i just want to highlight is that many people say that you should go on for initiating a group discussion see learners initiation shows that you are taking lead you are the leader that's really good but if you are not having much of the points to speak don't take the initiation because that is again going to bring you negative points if you take initiation and throughout the gd you are sitting quiet 
that in fact adds negative points to your back. So initiate when you are confident, when you have the idea about the topic, fine. So see these are some of the do's and don'ts which you need to make sure that whenever you are in the GD room, you are following these steps, these strategies so that you can make yourself more effective as well as an impactful speaker in the group discussion. So now moving forward towards the second part of this session that is building resume. How you can go on for writing good resumes but before that I need to make you understand that what we mean by a resume. What a resume is? A resume is actually a formal document. Yes, it is a formal document that is going to provide the details about you, the overview about your professional qualifications, about your educational qualifications, about your skills, abilities, competencies, accomplishments and so on. If I go back to the genesis of this term that's resume, resume, the spelling of resume actually originates from French which means summary. So what you tend to do in resume? You tend to summarize your qualifications whether professional, educational, your accomplishments, your skills and so on. So you tend to summarize these things, right? Now I am going to talk about some of the myths for the resume. People believe that resume is only, the purpose of resume is only to list all your skills. Just jot down the things, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, these are my professional communication skills, these are my skills, competence, no. In fact, resume should be taken as a repo building document between you and the employer. It's not only that you are going to list your skills, it is also that how you are listing, how you are communicating those skills to your people. In what manner? Because it is a repo building strategy which you can go for. Either you are going to build the repo or you are going to just thrash the repo. Also another myth about resume is that good resumes get the job. Really? No, good resumes only help you out getting inside the interview room, that's it. If you believe that just on the basis of resume you are going to be selected, no, not at all. Yes, that's the fact that good resumes, they'll help you out in getting inside the room. Whatever accomplishments you have mentioned, it is going to help you or professional qualifications or educational qualifications, it is going to help you to get inside the interview room. But after that, you need to perform there, right? Another myth about resume is resumes are read carefully. Now you might be wondering that if they are not being read carefully, why am I even telling you about resumes? Why I am motivating you to prepare resumes and I am telling you about how to build a good resume. See, what happens is that when we talk about resumes, in the initial 20 to 30 seconds, the person, the reader or the interviewer or the person who is looking after your resume, he or she is going to make an impression about it. And that impression will be leading forward that whether he or she is going to read your resume or do not read. Take example, if your resume is haphazardly placed, somewhere it's qualifications, somewhere it's educational qualifications, somewhere again coming up with skills, no proper format, no proper way, no proper systematic way is there. The people, they are not even going to read the resume. And nowadays there are certain companies who tend to use certain softwares to shortlist the resumes based on some keywords. So in that case, your resume is not even going there. So how you think that it is going to be read carefully, fine? Right? So that's the myth. Another myth which is about that if you get your resume prepared by some resume service agency, then you will be 
on the positive end and you will be getting more jobs. No, that is a myth. Because what I believe personally is that no one knows you better than you. How can a resume service company can tell about me? Yes, they might help you in coming up with some templates and all those things. But that is a personal advice from my end that you should go on for preparing your resumes on your own. Taking help from the templates and all such things, you can always go for it. But place each and every word from your side. So, these were some of the myths which are quite common when we talk in context of resumes. Uh, moving further, I am going to talk about preparing resume, right? How we will be preparing the resumes. So, the very first thing which we are concerned about is gathering pertinent information. Before drafting or before composing a resume, the very first thing is that you should know each and every detail. Now, you might be wondering that, oh, that is my detail, I know everything. Yes, you know, but at the same time, before going for the preparation of resume, you should have everything in your hand, whether it is about your personal history or your professional or your educational. You should know the dates for both, right? You should know the affiliations. And that too, when I say affiliations, that should be correct spelling as well. Many a times people tend to commit mistakes with the spelling. So, why I am saying gathering pertinent information? So, gather the information linked with everything. That what information you want to put on your resume. That needs to be with you. So, that you can move ahead. The second thing which is more about selecting the best medium. Yes, there we have traditional paper resumes as well as nowadays we are going for electronic media as well. So, that is again your choice that whether you want to go for the traditional paper resumes wherein you will be getting it printed on a, sheet, on a paper and then you will be providing it in the hard copy or else you just want to go for the email or PDFs kind of thing, right. Now, my suggestion to all of you is that irrespective of the fact that you are sending your resumes by the help of electronic media, you should always have a copy of resume in your hand. That is the traditional paper copy of your resume very neatly printed on a plain paper, on a fine paper, you should always have this. So, this is what you need to select the medium, okay. If some of the employer, he or she is sitting uh, distant apart from you and uh, sending a paper resume is again not a wise idea, you can go for the electronic medium. But again, if you believe that paper resume can be sent, then go for that because that is again more impactful. Again, I am not commenting that electronic media is not impactful, I am not saying this, fine. Now, the third thing, third thing is about organizing your resume around the strengths. So, before writing, before drafting the message, drafting the resume, you should be very, very clear with your strengths and weaknesses. Now, when I say strength and weaknesses, you might be wondering that we tend not to write weakness in the resume. Yes, we do not write. That is absolutely true, but you should know. Might be possible that you have secured 50 percent in your high school, but after that you started doing good in your academics, but that 54 percent you need to mention and at the same time, it might be coming across as your weakness for one or the other reason. So, why you need to know your weakness? So, that you can be prepared with proper justifications, proper reasons behind that, that why it happened. Also, there are some situations when there are very frequent job changes. You are a kind of a job hopper that you kept on changing your companies 
and like this. In that case, if you are having very less less experience in different companies, do not go on for setting it differently. Try to club it under one responsibility or one position or designation kind of thing. Try to do that. That is going to be more helpful because when it is frequent job changes, it tends to give an impression if you are going to mention separately, it is going to give an impression that you uh, tend to either get bored from some of the company or the work or you are not the suitable candidate. So, just to justify or to remove that particular notion, try to club similar kind of jobs together. right? Now, if there are certain gaps in the work history, if it is a justifiable gap, justifiable gap in terms of that are due to some injury, due to some personal reason, if it is there, you can mention it in your covering letter, in your uh, uh, letter which you are sending as a cover letter, right. There you can mention, but if in case due to some other reason, not very valid reasons, there are certain gaps, try to cover up with some kind of social work which you might have done during this time, right, for some social cause. Also make sure that your resume should not be overqualified, right, for whatever job you are applying it should be linked up to that. One more point is there, when I talk about organizing resume around your strength, many a times what happens that you tend to have a long term employment with one company and you forget showing him the career progression. What do you mention that Mr. X as this particular position worked in this company from 2009 to 2021? No, that is a wrong way, that is a wrong way. Go for the career progression. Yes, you are there in the company from 2009 to 2021, but show the career progression that how you were moving up in the ladder. Your responsibility here was something else, then it is again moving ahead. That you need to go for. If you are just simply mentioning that July 2009 to July, uh, July 2021 worked in this company as this, no. It shows that you are weak because in last so many years you were not able to reach anywhere. You were on the similar designation, do not do this. Job termination for a cause is again, uh, for example, if you are being laid off due to some reason, due to some recession or something like that, yes, it is fine, you will be terminated and, uh, and if you want to somewhere go for it, okay, that was not my fault. Add some of the more reference letters, add this thing in the covering letter also, that what happened with you. If you have some criminal record, do not hide it. Again, I am not saying that you need to place it on your resume, right? I am not saying this, but do not hide the things from the interviewer or the employer. So, these are some of the tactics how you can go on for organizing your resume around your strengths, right? Do not make, because certain times these points, they uh, seem as if they are disadvantageous to us, but they are not. Try to bring them on the advantageous position. Now, the, the next thing talks about in this organizing only that what approach you are going to talk. Either you can go for chronological approach. Now, chronological approach is one of the most widely used approach by the employers. In this approach, what you can do is you can start with your experience. If you are, you are having more of the work experience in different organizations with different roles and so on. If that is enriched, then you should start with the experience aspect followed by the education and then the achievements, right? Now, if in case you are a fresher, you might not be having more of the experience. So, what you can do is you can bring your education aspect and then your experience and then you can go on for with the achievements. Contrary to this, we have another approach that is functional resumes. Now, in functional resumes, they are skill based resumes, wherein you tend to start with your skills, right? Whatever your skills are and then you go on for mentioning your work history and then your education. 
Now such resumes are good when because as an employer you need not to look for the uh, job description and job specification because you are going to tell all this here. Now again place the things strategically so that your resume can get you a good job. The third approach is combination resume approach wherein you will be going for the chronology as well as the functional aspect but one major disadvantage of this particular approach is that you end up coming up with huge information repetitive information which you tend to mention in the skill also and in the qualification also and in the experience also. So, this is one negative aspect of this I will just quickly summarize here with this figure chronological list the most recent position preferred by employers most common type whereas functional you will be focusing on the skills and experience and yes by people who are changing careers very oftenly job hopping is there right. So, for them it is actually good why it is good because in the functional you are just focusing more on the functional aspects the skills the abilities the competencies rather than focusing on the job hopping kind of thing. Combination is a mix but again certain times just out of repetitive nature it is not again people favor it. Now after this the fourth section talks about writing your resume wherein you need to make sure that you are very 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 honest while writing down adapt your resume to the audience in terms of language in terms of terminology also use short phrases do not use very big sentences. Now, because once you will be into this writing your resume you need to think about composing or drafting a message. Now, when we say composing the very first point talks about your personal details. Then it is more about the summary. Now, summary can be about career objective. Do not go for very fancy career objective keep it simple keep it simple. Then it can be your professional qualification or association you can say it can be preceded by educational qualification then your skills if you are following the chronological order abilities and so on and then majorly about the details or you can say it as you can say it as personal data wherein you tend to involve gender, age, uh, marital status, nationality and so on. See if you are sending uh, your resume to a US firm they do not favor having this personal data because they believe that the moment they are going to have your personal data they can make biased decisions. So, again you need to go for it that whether this particular you should research that whether this particular company wants this or does not want this. Even you will be um, glad to know this that US firms they do not prefer having a photograph of the candidate on the resume. Because again the same reason they believe that out of uh, after seeing the picture they might get more biased. So, these are some of the reasons apart from that the references now always be prepared with the valid references two three references wherein you should uh, prepare a sheet properly with the name with the affiliation with the designation with the contact number of your references fine. So, this is how you should go on for drafting a resume. Now, it is about completing wherein you will be revising your resume, producing your resume either in the PDF form or in the traditional paper form and you should go on for the proofreading of your resume fine. So, this was all about that how you should go on for preparing a resume. Now, towards the end I am just going to show you some of the bad examples of resumes so that you people 
should refrain yourself from getting into such situation wherein they are going to create negative impact of your personality on the employer. The very first thing is the bad speller. You can see many a times this happens with us also. We tend to commit spelling mistakes. Again and again I am telling you that please rewrite, reread, proofread your resume again and again because the moment employers saw that there is some spelling mistakes, this makes them believe that you are not that much dedicated or sincere towards that job. So don't do this mistake. Also the amateur graphic designer. See in this resume what you can observe? Too many graphics are being added. See the picture of the person somewhere, these graphics not required, not required. Make your resume very, very, very simple. Apart from that, the font abuser. Can you see the font? Is it readable? No. Make sure the font style and the font size should be appropriate. Commonly we believe that comic sense and all such font styles should never be used in the resume. It is Times New Roman you can use, you can use Calibri and so on. So please select the appropriate font style. Also the gamer, see it is always good to mention your hobbies but make sure that your hobbies are linked with the job for which you are applying. So make sure it should be linked with the job itself, right? Also the autobiographer. See, three, four pages long resume. No, go for simple, short, concise resumes. In fact, the formula says that if you are having experience up to 10 years, it should be only one page resume. Beyond 10 years, yes, you can move on to the two pages, but again, it should be at the minimum end. So don't become the autobiographer, that's not required here. The buzzwords enthusiast, read this, motivated go-getter with robust experience in maximizing energy to drive results. What is this? You are using such words like go-getters, enthusiast, no, such words are not required. They are not required here, right? Keep it simple, keep your career objective very, very simple. The formatting disaster, make sure that formatting should be common, should be equal, right? That is again a very important aspect which makes your resume looks good. Title inflation, yes, some people they just add CEO even if they are not and they tend to inflate it. Also, when you are not showing the career progression, if you are into some long term employment, do not reference those people with whom you do not share good relationship. Sloppiness, many a times when you present your resume, it is having certain wrong marks, bad marks, cert certain stains, make sure it is not there. Unnecessary information about the previous employer should be avoided. So these are some of the ways which you can avoid and can make your resumes look more good. So dear learners, I hope you are able to understand the basic concept of group discussion, the types, the strategies for making yourself do a good discussion during the group discussion. Also you are able to understand how to build an effective resume and what are the common mistakes you should avoid while you are designing a resume. So, dear learners, thank you and happy learning.